one October evening in 1834, a fire which had been stoked rashly in the antiquated heating system of the old palace of Westminster burst out into an uncontrollable blaze. Within hours it was racing through the rabbit warren of medieval and modern buildings that comprised the old Houses of Parliament. By dawn, much of the building lay in ruins. It was a national disaster. A series of images from the Parliament's art collection commemorating what was lost and what was saved now forms the subject of an exhibition. The guest curator is Caroline Shenton from the Parliamentary Archives. What do these images tell us about the look and the layout of the old palace before the fire? Well, essentially, this was a medieval building that had grown up over time, been added to over the centuries, become completely chaotic. Um, MPs felt that it was a really terrible place to work by 1834. They felt they were packed into this incredibly stuffy, hot, cramped space, packed in like herrings in a barrel, one of them said, and that it was just an intolerable place to have to conduct the business of a legislature. And there were plans to potentially move away from Westminster. There were debates about maybe moving to St James's Park or even Regent's Park or just expanding the palace towards the river just to create more space, but they didn't come to anything and eventually the decision was made for them. This section of the exhibition puts us into the heart of the drama, the fire itself. How come that the mother of all parliaments came to burn down? It really was an accident waiting to happen. The greatest act of stupidity on record, according to the Prime Minister. It was caused by the ill-advised burning of two cartloads worth of tally sticks, which had been inside the Exchequer buildings at Westminster. This is a replica tally stick. A tally stick is a form of medieval receipt for taxes. If you were a sheriff in the Middle Ages, you'd be asked by the king to go off and collect taxes. And when you arrived at Westminster to hand them over twice a year, you'd be cut a tally stick by the exchequer. And it's just a piece of wood with notches in, showing how much money you've paid in, sliced down the middle, and you keep one half, the exchequer keeps the other half, and it's possible to match the two up or tally them up in case anybody challenges how much money you've paid in. The original plan was to make a bonfire outside, but then that was going to cause too much annoyance to the neighbours, they thought. So someone decided to burn them in the furnaces under the House of Lords chamber, which in the end caused this fire and a great deal more annoyance to the neighbours. On the day of the 16th of October, there was a little bit of smoke in the air, there was a smell of burning, but it was only around four o'clock in the afternoon that the housekeeper who was showing two tourists around in the chamber heard their complaints that they couldn't see the famous Armada tapestries in the room because there was so much smoke there. She didn't go and investigate and a couple of hours later an enormous fireball burst out of the frontage of the House of Lords and lit up the London skyline. It must have been a tremendous public spectacle, a real crowd puller. It was really the most significant blaze in London between 1666 and the Blitz. Hundreds of thousands of people flocked to Westminster almost immediately. The, the streets and the bridges became clogged very, very quickly. It could be seen from right across London. The King and Queen could see it in Windsor, 20 miles away. Of course, it wasn't just the public that flocked down to witness the fire. Many artists came too. At least 44 artists captured either the fire or its aftermath, the ruins, and many of those pictures are now in the Parliamentary Works of Art collection. And they provide a fantastic documentary source for the progress of the fire, and they're often also the only record we have of what the old palace was like. It's really a form of reportage of this incredible event that nobody forgot through the rest of their lives. There's a print by Heath of the fire, and he was actually there on the spot, drawing at the moment of the fire. That's right. The, he very proudly says underneath this lithograph, drawn on stone by the light of the flames. And it's true that the blaze was so great that people could read newspapers a quarter of a mile away, as if it was noonday, they said. What do these images tell us about the progress of the fire throughout the structures? Because they show buildings which have now vanished. The fire didn't destroy the whole palace, but it destroyed its medieval core. So um, very famous apartments like the Painted Chamber, like the House of Lords Chamber, were completely um, obliterated by this fire. 
Some of these pictures capture the excitement of tens of thousands of people flocking down to the river, crowding into boats to get a good view. It was said uh, on the night that it was possible to walk from the Lambeth side of the river to the Westminster side just by jumping from boat to boat because there were so, so many craft on the river. From some of these pictures you see there's a kind of beach or foreshore crowded with spectators, often very close to the flames themselves. And it's a reminder that before the days of the embankment, before the new palace, the river didn't come quite up to the perimeter of Parliament. When Charles Barry designed the new palace, he actually built out into the river. The old palace simply had gardens on its eastern side, outside the apartments, and then a muddy shoreline straight down to the tidal Thames. And that was one of the problems in fighting the fire on the night. It was low tide for most of the evening, and what that meant was that the firemen in the gardens outside the palace couldn't get their hoses to the water supply to suck up the water. And they had to wait for their super duper piece of BMW kit to come up river, the great floating engine from Rotherhithe. Um, but because it was low tide, it couldn't get there until two in the morning. And it was only then that the tide literally and metaphorically started to turn and parts of the building were saved. There's a very graphic image by George Campion that puts you right into the heart of the action in the attempts to save Westminster Hall with its magnificent medieval roof. What's going on? What we can see here are hundreds of volunteers from the King's sons and cabinet ministers down to ordinary labourers and stonemasons desperately trying to save the hall. On the ground we've got a series of fire engines. In fact, they're all strung together. You can see people also shinning up ladders to the windows and up the scaffolding that's there because there was stonework repairs going on at the time of the fire anyway. And they're doing two things. One is they're perhaps getting um, uh, possessions and valuables out of the speaker's house, which is on the left-hand side wall here, behind this wall. Um, but they're also, some of them, um, breaking open the windows in order to climb up onto the roof and take the, uh, the lead tiles off the roof um, to create a fire break to stop the fire getting further into the hall with its magnificent 14th century hammer beam roof, one of the masterpieces of medieval carpentry. By dawn of the following day, the extent of the damage was evident. Just how much of the Palace of Westminster was lost forever? About half of the old Palace of Westminster was gone. Westminster Hall had been saved, but the core medieval apartments had disappeared, including very famous parts of the building, the Painted Chamber and St Stephen's Chapel, which had been the old House of Commons. And these were incredibly influential buildings in terms of English architecture from the Middle Ages onwards. So it was an enormous architectural loss. And of course, it wasn't just the buildings. It was the furnishings, the artefacts, the documents as well, which vanished. Some salvage occurred and furniture from the building was placed in St Margaret's Church and the road opposite. Um, but uh, tapestries like the great and famous Armada tapestries perished almost immediately. They were at the centre of the fire. Um, and in terms of the archives of Parliament, it was also a huge disaster. Uh, nearly all of the records of the House of Commons were destroyed in the fire because they were kept in that central portion of the palace, which suffered the worst. Time hadn't been kind to the Palace of Westminster, and what the fire did was reveal some of the architectural wonders that had been buried by many later additions. For antiquaries surveying the ruins afterwards or tourists coming just to wander around this building they didn't normally have access to. It was an incredible experience because particularly for St Stephen's Chapel, the old House of Commons, the roof had fallen in, taking with it the ceilings and floors put in at the end of the 17th century and revealing it once again to be the medieval chapel, wonderful Gothic chapel that it was in the middle of the 14th century. What does this exhibition show about how Parliament rose again from the ashes? Temporary accommodation had to be found and amazingly they'd fixed up ruined bits of the palace as temporary chambers and temporary committee rooms by uh, the following February. So it was ready to be used and that temporary accommodation carried on until around 1850, 1852. Um, and so, for example, Queen Victoria at her first state opening in 1837 walked through parts of the old palace to open the House of Lords session. 
There's an aerial view of the new palace starting to take shape. There's the stump of what became the Victoria Tower and the stump of what now we call Big Ben. How did they get that image? This must have been sketched from a balloon, probably in the very late 1840s or around 1850. And the poignant thing about this picture is that you can see the remnants of the old palace nestling in Old Palace Yard as the huge new palace builds up around it. And it's really our final farewell. Another really interesting thing to come out of the fire um, were the souvenirs that people made out of the salvaged stonework and um, woodwork of the palace. And there are various snuff boxes and so on that occasionally turn up on the market. And I've got a souvenir here, and this is allegedly made from the lead that melted off the roof of St Stephen's on the night of the fire. And a very enterprising seal manufacturer called Double Days of Little Russell Street by the British Museum has cast this into um, this souvenir um, which shows the seal of St Stephen um, and it's got a little loop on the side of it and I think that this must have been threaded through a chain and perhaps used as a gentleman's watch fob or something like that. So this is really a little personal memento to complement the art in this exhibition which shows the impact of this great national disaster.